Hello, welcome to the uh, medical licensure Emerson channel. So today we are going to introduce a new playlist on the channel, so which will cover anatomy and physiology. So there will be a combination of both anatomy and physiology of uh, of body structures and uh, systems. Okay, so let's start uh, right ahead. Okay, so in terms of introduction, anatomy, or in terms of definition, anatomy is made up of two words, which is ana, uh, anatom, as, uh, anatomy, then ana stands for up, then tom is for process of cutting. Okay, so anatomy is the science of body structures and the relationships among them, which is a branch of science that provides the foundation for understanding the body's parts. Then uh, Andreas uh, Vesalius is uh, known as the father of anatomy and uh, he belonged in the 16th century. Then physiology is, uh, so physio means nature and log uh, means a study of. So physiology is the, study, the science of body functions and how the body parts work. Then like anatomy, Physiology has many sub, uh, subdivisions. For example, there is neurophysiology, which explains the burning, the working of the nervous system and the cardiac uh, physiology studies. And the cardiac physiology studies uh, the function of, uh, of the heart. Okay. And then uh, anatomy was first described or first studied by dissection, which is uh, taking... Uh, which is taking a part, or, which is an act of uh, cutting and uh, taking a part of sections. Okay, and then uh, the care of cutting a part of body structures to study their relationships. That's dissection, as you can see, as it's been as it is been illust uh, illustrated here. Okay, and then. Anatomy is divided in two, two components. We have the microscopic anatomy and the macroscopic anatomy. Okay, so my, microscopic anatomy is a study of structures too small to be seen by the naked, by the naked eye or ones which cannot be seen without magnification. Okay, so let me just go back. So, they cannot be seen by uh, they cannot be seen without magnification sorry okay so microscopic anatomy is subdivided into specialties that consider features within a characteristic range of sizes okay so we have one which is cytology which analyzes the internal structures of cells the smallest units of life cellular structure and functions then we also have another section which is histology which takes a broader perspective and examines tissues, groups, and specialized cells and cell products that work together and perform specific functions. And uh, microscope, which is in short, we are talking about the microscopic structure of tissues. Okay. Then, in terms of the macroscopic anatomy, the macroscopic anatomy, which is gross anatomy, is the study of structures and features that are visible to the unaided or naked eye. Then it is further divided into, we have surface anatomy, which is the study of general anatomical form or morphology, and how superficial uh, or the su superficial or surface anatomical markings relate to deeper anatomical structures. So structures that can be examined without using a microscope. Okay, that's uh, surface anatomy. Then we have regional anatomy, where all structures in one particular region, specific regions of the body, such as the head or chest. That's regional anatomy. Okay. And then the third uh, system is the, th the third uh, division is systemic anatomy, which is the study of anatomical uh, study of anatomy based on the based upon the body's organ systems. Structure of specific systems of the body, such as the nervous or respiratory systems. Then we have the chemical level, which includes atoms, which are the smallest units of matter that uh, 
this is more of uh, the levels of structural organization okay so this part we are talking about structural organization so there are different types of structural organization but the uh, first one is chemical chemical level which includes atoms which are the smallest units of matter that participate in chemical reactions and molecules we are so two or more atoms joined together that's a molecule then we have the cellular level where now the molecules themselves combine to form what we call cells for example muscle cells nerve cells and epithelial cells then tissue level is where we have now the tissues which are groups uh, the tissues which are groups of muscles which are groups of cells and the materials surrounding them that work together to perform a specific a particular function and there are just four basic uh, types of tissues in your uh, in your body so you have the epithelial tissue connect, connective tissue muscular tissue and the nervous tissue so these are the tissue level then if we go to the organ level where we have organs which are structures that are composed of two or more different types of tissues and they have specific functions and usually have recognizable shapes examples of organs are the stomach skin bones heart liver lungs and uh, brain then we have the systemic uh, level which is now composed of a system so a system com consists of related groups of organs with a common function example of the system level also called the organ organ system level is a digestive system which breaks down and absorb uh, absorbs food and its organs include the mouth saliva glands uh, pharynx to the throat esophagus stomach and small intestine large intestine liver gallbladder and uh, pancreas these are the uh, one of the systems then we also have another system which is the organismal system where an, where an organism or any living individual and all parts of the human body functioning together constitute the total organism so this is more just a, uh, a diagram showing the different levels of structural organization in the human body so you mentioned of the chemical level to the cellular level to the tissue level the organ level to the system level and finally the organismal level okay then since we talked about the systems we have about 11 systems of the body then now we have the integumentary system which, uh, which whose components are the skin and structures associated with it such as air nails sweat glands and oil glands then functions is protects the body helps regulate body temperature eliminates some wastes and help maintain vitamin d and detect sensations such as touch pain and warmth and uh, as well as cold then we have the secretor system which whose components are the bones and joints of the body and their associated cartridges then functions include supports and uh, protects the body provides a surface area for muscle attachments and aids body movements and houses cells that produce blood cells stores minerals and lipids okay then another system is the muscular system whose components include muscles composed which are composed of skeletal muscles uh, uh, muscle tissue so named because it is usually attached to bones okay then uh, the functions uh, produces body movements such as walking and also stabilizes body positions which is posture and generates heat okay then the nervous system so the nervous system components include the brain uh, spinal cord nerves special sense special sense organs such as the eyes and the ears then functions uh, generates action potentials which are nerve impulses to regulate uh, body activities detect changes in the body's internal and external environments and interprets the changes and responds by causing muscular contractions or glandular secretions this is the nervous system then the endocrine system components include hormone producing glands such as the pineal glands hypothalamus pituitary glands thymus thyroid gland parathyroid glands adrenal glands pancreas ovaries and testes 
and hormone producing cells in several other organs. Then functions, reg they regulate body activities by releasing hormones which are chemical messengers transported in blood from an endocrine gland or tissue to a target organ. Okay, this is the endocrine system. Then the cardiovascular system components include blood, heart, and blood vessels. Then functions, uh, the heart pumps uh, blood through the blood vessels. Then blood carries ox oxygen and nutrients to cells and carbon dioxide and wastes away from, from cells and helps regulate acid-based uh, balance. Then temperature and uh, water content of body fluids, which are the blood components, help defend against the disease and repair damaged uh, blood vessels. Okay. That's the thing about uh, the cardiovascular system. Then the digestive system, the components include organs of gastrointestinal tract, a long tube that includes the mouth, uh, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small and large intestines, and anus. Also includes accessory organs that, that assist in digestive processes such as the saliva glands, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. Then functions in, uh, which achieves physical and chemical uh, breakdown of food, absorbs nutrients, eliminates solid uh, wastes. Okay. Then the urinary system has components of the kidneys, urea, uh, uh, ureters, urinary bladder, and the urethra. Then function, they produces, stores, and eliminates urine, eliminates wastes, and degrades volume of volume and chemical composition of blood, helps maintain the acid-base balance of the body fluids, maintains body's, uh, body's mineral, mineral uh, balance, helps regulate production of red blood cells. Okay. Then the other system is uh, the lymphatic system and immunity, whose components include the lymphatic fluid, which is the lymph and vessels, also includes the spleen, thymus, lymph nodes, and tonsils. Functions include uh, return, retains, of, retains uh, proteins and fluid to blood, carries lipids from gastrointestinal tract to blood, and includes structures where lymphocytes that protect against disease-causing microbes mature and proliferate. Okay. Then the other system is the respiratory system, whose components include the lungs, the air passageways, such as the pharynx, the larynx, and trachea, and the bronchial tubes, leading into and out of the lungs. Then functions include the transfer, transferring uh, oxygen from uh, inhaled air to blood and carbon dioxide, from blood to exhaled air, and uh, helps regulate acid-base balance of body fluids. Air flowing out of the lung through the vocal cord produces sounds. That's more of the components and their functions. Then we have the reproductive system, whose components include the gonads, which are the testes in males and ovaries in females, and associated organs such as the uterine tubes, uterus, and vagina in females. Then in males, the epidermis, the ductus deferens, and the penis. Then functions include the gonads, function includes. So in terms of gonads, they produce gametes, then sperm or oocysts, then that unite to form a new organism. Then gonads also release hormones that regulate production and other body processes. Then associated organs transport and store gametes. Okay. Then we can now go to the basic life processes. So the basic life processes include, uh, there are six Important uh, life processes of human body, which are metabolism, which is number one. So metabolism is the sum of all chemical processes that occur in the body. And uh, we are, in terms of the cell mechanism, we have catabolism and anabolism. So catabolism and anabolism. The, so catabolism is the breakdown of complex chemical substances into simpler components. For example, digestion of proteins into amino acids. Then anabolism is the building up of chemi complex chemical substance from smaller, simpler components such as use of amino acids to build up new proteins of the body. Then the other life process is responsiveness, which is the body's ability to detect and respond to changes. 
Then movement, which includes motion of the whole body, individual organs, single cells, etc. Then we have growth, which is an increase in body size and, and weight. Then differentiation, it is the development of a cell from an unspecialized to a specialized state. That's differentiation. Then the other life process is reproduction, which is the formation of new cells or to the production of a new individual. Okay, then you can talk about homeostasis. So homeostasis is a self-sustaining mechanism in an organism that tries to maintain stable internal uh, conditions. So without homeostasis, organisms would not be able to have stable in internal conditions and therefore would not be able to survive. Then homeostasis is a dynamic condition in response to changing conditions. Then the two body systems that largely control the body's homeostatic state, that is the nervous system and uh, the endocrine system. So homeostasis is continually being disrupt disrupted by the external stimuli, intense heat, cold and lack of oxygen, internal stimuli, the psychological stresses, exercise, disruptions that, that are usually mild and temporary, then if homeostasis is not maintained, death may result. Then in terms of control of homeostasis, also homeostatic imbalances occur because of disruptions from external or internal environments. So homeostasis is regulated by the nervous system and the endocrine system acting together or independently. Then the nervous system detects changes and sends nerve impulses to counteract the disruption. Then the endocrine system regrets homeostasis by secreting hormones. Whereas nerve impulses cause rapid changes, hormones usually work more slowly. Then uh, continue, continuing from the control of homeostasis, so regardless of the factors being regretted, which is the variable, all homeostatic control mechanisms have at least three inter interdependent components. The first component, which is the receptor, which is some type of sensor that monitors the environment and responds to changes called the stimuli by sending information, which is the input, to the second component, which is the control center. Then input flow flows from uh, the receptor to the control center along the so-called afferent pathway. Then the control center analyzes the input it receives and then determines the appropriate response or course of action. Then the third component, which is the effector, which provides the means of response or output to the stimulus. Then the information flows from the control center to the effector along the efferent pathway. Then the results of the response then uh, the feedback to influence the stimulus. So either depressing it, which is the negative feedback, so that the O control mechanism is shut off, or it actually enhances it, which is the positive feedback, so that the reaction continues at an, ev at an even faster rate. Then the homeostatic control mechanisms are of two types, which we, we mentioned earlier. We, we mentioned the negative feedback mechanism, where the net effect of the response to the stimulus is the shut off of the original stimulus or to reduce its intensity. That's, uh, for example, the body temperature, blood chemicals and heart rate, blood pressure, the rate and depth of breathing, uh, the blood levels of oxygen, carbon dioxide and minerals. Then the other mechanism is the positive feedback mechanism which is ten tend to increase the original dependence, dependence with the stimuli and push the variable uh, further away from its original value. That's the positive feed, uh, feedback. Then homeostatic imbalances occur because of disruption from external or internal environments, as we discussed. So homeostasis is regulated by the nervous system and the endocrine system 
acting together or independently. Then the nervous system detects changes and sends nerve impulses to counteract the disruption. Then the endocrine system regulates homeostasis by secreting hormones. So whereas nerve impulses cause rapid changes, hormones usually work more slowly. Okay, so that's the end of the homeostasis. We can now talk about the planes of the body, terms of rotation, terms of uh, terms of direction and orientation. Okay, so we have body positions, so which are which are just descriptions of any region or part of the human body where which assumes uh, uh, assume that it is in a specific stance called the anatomical position. So we assume that the body is in a specific stance called the anatomical position. Then in the anatomical position, the subject uh, stands erect facing the observer with the head level and the eyes facing directly forward. Then the feet are flat on the floor and directed forward and the upper limbs are at the sides with the palms ten, uh, turned forward. Then in the anatomical position, the body is upright. Two terms describe a, a reclining body. Reclining body. So the two terms are if the body is lying uh, is lying face down, it is termed prone position. Then if the body is lying face up, it is termed supine position. Okay, so this is the anatomical position and uh, in terms of the anterior view and the posterior view, feel free to pause the video. Then this is the uh, supine position and the prone position. Then in terms of anatomical directional terms, so the terms of uh, direction, so we have uh, directional terms which, is, uh, which are used to describe the location of one body part in addition to another. Uh, we have the word anterior, which is ventral, which which when when the object or it is nearer to or at the front of the body or the part in question, for example, the sternum or the breastbone is anterior to the heart. Then the posterior to the dorsal is the, just a term uh, which means nearer to or at the back of the body. For example, the esophagus is posterior to the trachea or windpipe. Then superior, which means which was referred to as cephalic or cranial, means towards the head or the upper part of the structure. For example, the heart is superior to the liver. Then peripheral means that a body part is situated away from the center of the body or an organ. Then the peripheral nervous system is located outside the central nervous system okay then other terminologies include the inferior which is called which means away from the head or the lower part of the structure for example the stomach is inferior to the lungs then the other terminologies which we can have we can have medial which is nearer to the midline for example the ulna is medial to the radius then the other term which we can have is the lateral so lateral means further from the midline. For example, the lungs are lateral to the heart. Then intermediate means we can have uh, between two structures. For example, the transverse colon is intermediate between the ascending and the descending colon. Then the other word we can have is ipsilateral. So ipsilateral means that on means on the same side of the body as another structure. For example, the gallbladder and the ascending colon are ipsilateral. Then we have an opposite word, which is the contralateral, which means on the opposite side of the body from another structure. For example, the ascending and descending colons are contralateral. Then the other word is uh, proximal. So proximal means nearer to the attached, attached attachment of a limb to the trunk, or nearer to the origination of a structure such as the humerus is proximal to the radius then the other words which we have is distal which is further from the attachment of a limb to the trunk or further from the origination of a structure such as the pharynges are distal to the couples 
Okay, then the other way is you can have is superficial or external. So superficial means toward or on the surface of the body. For example, the ribs are superficial to the lungs. Then the other word is deep, which means internal or which means away from the surface of the body. For example, the ribs are deep to the skin of the chest and back. Okay, those are anatomical the directional terms. Then the other terms which we can have, we can have an anterior inferior, which means in front and below. We can also have anterior lateral, which means in front and to the side, especially the outside. The other ways we can have is in anterior medial, which means in front and toward the inner side or midline. The other ways we can have are anterior posterior, which means relating to both front and rear. The other ways we can have is anterior superior, which means in front and above. Then the other way is posterior inferior, which means behind and below, or in back and below. Then the other way is posterior lateral, which means behind and to one side, specifically to the outside. Okay. Then the other word is posterior middle, which means behind and to the inner side. Then the last word is the posterior superior, which means behind and at the upper part. So these are some of the directional terms as shown in the uh, pictures provided. Okay, so these are the terms. Feel free to pause and uh, uh, go through and look at specific so that we are aware of the terminologies which we use in the anatomy. Okay, then we can now go to anatomical planes. So an anatomical plane is an hypothetical flat surface which is used to transect the human body in order to describe the location of structures and the direction of movements. So we have uh, an, a, an anatomical plane called the sagittal or median plane which divides the body into two equal rights, the right, the right and the left sides. So then the mid sagittal plane divides the body into equal halves. So body parts close to the midline or plane are said to be medial. Then body parts away from the midline are said to be lateral. Okay. Then we have another plane which is known as the front, the frontal or coronal plane, which divides the body into front and back sections. Then body parts in front of planes or on the front of the body are said to be anterior or ventral. Then body parts at the back of plane or on the back of the body are said to be posterior or dorsal. Then the other plane is a transverse or horizontal plane. The horizontal plane is the plane that divides the body into top and bottom, bottom parts. So the bottom parts above other parts, other other parts are called superior, whilst body parts below other parts are called inferior. For example, the nose is superior to the mouth but inferior to the eyes. Okay, then we have anatomical axis. We have the anatomical axis, the longitudinal axis, the horizontal axis, and the anterior posterior axis. So, the, uh, an axis is an imaginary line in, about which the body rotates. Then a lot of our movements occurs in the joints and axes are used to describe the direction of, of movement at joints. Then there are three basic axes which we have already mentioned, the longitudinal, horizontal and the anterior, posterior. Okay, then we are can now finally talk about body cavities. So we have the cranial cavity and the thoracic cavity. We have the abdominal pelvic cavity and the spinal cavity. These are the body cavities. Then if we were to classify them into two, we can have the dorsal body cavity and the ventral body cavity. Hope we are together so far. So there are two sets of internal body cavities called the dorsal and the ventral body cavities. So these cavities are close to the outside. So first thing first, the dorsal body cavity protect which protects the fragile 
uh, nervous system organs as two subdivisions which is the cranial cavity which in, uh, meaning, meaning in the skull uh, which is found in the skull and then encases the brain then we have the vent the vertebra or the spinal cavity which runs within the bony vertebral columns which encloses the delicate spinal cord then we have the cranial and spinal cavities which are continuous with uh, the then the cranial and spinal cavities are continuous with one another then the ventral body cavity uh, which is the more anterior and larger of the closed body cavities is the ventral body cavity it has two major subdivisions the thoracic and the abdominal pelvic cavities and it houses internal organs collectively called the visceral. Then uh, they are separated by the diaphragm, which is a dome shaped muscle important in breathing. Then the abdominal pelvic cavity, as its name suggests, has two parts not physically separated by a muscular membrane, by a muscular or membrane O, which is the inferior part and the, pel and the pelvic cavity, and uh, lies which lies in the bony pelvis which is so the inferior part which is the pelvic cavity lies in the bony uh, pelvis that which is the pelvic cavity okay then we have the abdominal pelvic quadrants where we can uh, divide into four quadrants the right upper quadrant the left upper quadrant and the left lower quadrant and the right lower quadrant or we can divide into it into two nine regions, which is the right hypochondriac region, the epigastric region, the left hypochondriac region, the left lumbar region, the epigastric region, the right lumbar region, the right inguinal region, hypogastric region, and the left inguinal region. So this is the uh, view or the uh, nine regions of the. Uh, abdomen sp to be specific okay and in terms of the names of the lines uh, that are cutting that are dividing them into the line into nine we have the right and left mid clavicular lines then we have also have the uh, trans tubercular line and you have the subcostal line okay so these are the same things we are talking about okay then the other thing which is uh, important to take note of are the organs which lie uh, which lie in the in the same region so if we say what organs lie in the right hypochondriac region then you are supposed to actually know which organs are found in the right hypochondriac region in the uh, umbilical region in the left lumbar region that's what we mean by applied anatomy okay then uh, terms of motion so what are the terms to describe motion at joints okay so we have of course flexion which is the bending of a joint or decreasing the angle between two bones and in the fetal position we are flexing our joints so this is flexion then you have extension which is straightening a joint or increasing the angle between two bones then in the anatomical position we are extending our joints then we have hyper extension which is excessive extension of a of the parts at a joint beyond the anatomical position okay then we have other ways such as uh, adduction and abduction so uh, adduction is, is moving a body parts towards the midline of the body then we have abduction which is moving a body part away from the midline of the body and i remember when we were being taught this in school they used to tell us for you to remember abduction. Remember the word actual word, uh, kidnapping or abduction it means someone has been taken out has been taken away from home. So abduction in terms of motion means moving a body part away from the midline of the body. Okay, then we have a uh, pronation. So pronation is uh, turning the arm downward, uh, turning the arm downward. Uh, uh, facing the uh, facing the palm that's uh, a pronation then 
a supination is uh, turning the arm or foot upward okay so in short uh, that's uh, uh, that's supination so as you've seen by the pictures provided okay then we have other terms of motion such as retraction which is moving a part uh, backward so this is retraction then we have uh, protraction which is moving a part forward this is a protraction of a mandible and retraction of a mandible then we have elevation which is raising a part for instance elevation of mandible then depression is lowering a part which is an example is depression of a mandible then other terms of motion we have rotation which is turning on a single axis so this is a rotation then circumduction this is a uh, when a triplanar or circular motion at the hip or shoulder shoulder or combination of all the movements this is circumduction this is circumduction then we have internal rotation which is rotation of the hip or shoulder towards the midline okay that's internal uh, rotation okay then external rotation this is rotation of the hip or shoulder away from the midline that's external rotation then uh, we have other terms such as inversion evasion dosflexion and pantaflexion so inversion is turning the sole of the foot inwards so that is inversion then evasion is turning the sole of the foot outwards so this is outward then ankle movement uh, dosflexion is ankle movement bringing the foot towards the shin so this is this here is a dos flexion then plantar flexion is when the ankle movement points the foot downwards as you've seen here so that's the thing about uh, what we have talked about and this is will be very important when we actually start talk, um, talk about joints uh, because this most of these occur at joints so these are uh, terms of motion at joints okay in other terms of motion we have radio deviation so this is radio deviation which is the movement of the wrist towards the radius or lateral side then we have ulnar deviation which is the movement of the wrist towards the ulnar or medial side which is this one then we have opposition which is movement of the thumb across the palm of the hand so this is opposition so these are some of the things you have to learn in uh, anatomy and the terminologies which you'll be using and you have to pay specific attention because this is more of a language which you have to learn and which you'll be applying in most of the other programs other courses that you'll be taking as well okay otherwise that's the end of the tutorial if you haven't uh, yet subscribe please subscribe and hit the bell notification and uh, see you on the next uh, tutorial and check out the anatomy and physiology uh, playlist in the playlist section.